I've been doing a, a three-part series. Uh, I did uh, the first part last week on basic salvation. And the series is called uh, Gospel 101. And I'm talking about the gospel. Last week I talked about the basic, which is salvation. This week I want to talk about part two of the gospel. And <clears throat> the, the gospel is explained in the first four books of the New Testament, which are, are the Gospels, and then Acts, chapter, and, and Acts, the whole book of Acts. So the book of Acts is considered to be a part of the Gospels. And people don't <clears throat> know exactly who wrote it, but uh, I believe it was Mark. Uh, I believe Mark wrote most of the, the Acts. And people ask that, you know, once you have found Jesus, once uh, you have started working on your repentance, once you've been baptized, once you realize that uh, servitude is important, you start wondering, is there more? Is there more to this than just the gospel? Well, there's a pa another part of the gospel that many people fail to realize, and it's in Acts chapter 2, uh, 1 through 4, and I'll read this, it's Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, when you start craving the Lord and you start craving his goodness and his mercy and his, and his understanding, you start wondering there has to be more than just this basic salvation. And there is. There's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, I consider myself Pentecostal holiness. And the reason why I add holiness in there is because many Pentecostal churches don't believe in repentance. They don't believe that there's anything more than just the salvation prayer. But I believe in the whole gospel, not just part of the gospel. So Acts chapter 2 is part of the gospel. Think about it this way. Peter and the other apostles were already saved. They, they already knew Jesus. They already understood at this point, after Jesus uh, faced the cross, died and was resurrected, and now, and now in Acts chapter 2, he is beside the Father in heaven. Okay? So after all of this, Jesus started giving them revelation on what they have to do next. He said, you be in Jerusalem on this day. And they, and they obeyed. So obedience is greater than sacrifice, like it says in 2 Samuel chapter 15, uh, which uh, obedience is greater than sacrifice. So they obeyed, they were there, and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, some people get this baptism right when they say the sinner's prayer. But others, it takes a while because there's stuff in their life that need to be purged. There's sins in their life that need to be purged. They haven't repented. So, and I'll tell you this, the story of what was required of me in order to get the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
See, I was living, I was still living a life of sin. I was just now coming to the knowledge that I have to repent of these things. And I was still doing things in my life that God didn't approve of that made me filthy. Now, I kept asking Jesus. I knew there was a baptism of the Holy Ghost because it says so in Acts chapter 2. I asked the Lord, I said, am I not, I had tears in my eyes and I was on my knees and I said, Lord, what do I have to do to get this baptism of the Holy Ghost? What do I have to do? See, number one, I believe that there was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, so I was seeking that. I was seeking the next step. See, you have some people that don't believe that. They, they, they believe that everybody gets as soon as you say the sinner's prayer and that's false. Because if you're living a dirty, filthy life, you're sleeping with some woman that you're not married to or you're still living your homosexual life, the Holy Spirit can't dwell in you. Okay, when you say the when you say the sinner's prayer, okay, the Holy Ghost is not in you. He is with you. And, the, and this has been explained to me by Jesus. When you say the sinner's prayer, the Holy Ghost is with you. When you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, that means you've you've repented of 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 the sins that so easily ensnares you, as Paul calls it. Then you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. He is in you, in you. And after you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you start laying hands. You start using the gifts that God gave you, which require the fruits of the Spirit, and they go hand in hand. Uh, the fruits, uh, certain fruits are required for certain uh, gifts. That's why there, there are equal amounts of fruits and gifts. So when you start laying on hands and people start being healed, you have to know this, that it's not you doing it, that it's Jesus doing it through you. So now you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you. And that enables him to use you to do what he needs to do, which is heal, uh, which is prophesy. And not everybody that claims to be a prophet is a prophet. I mean, we, we, we've actually seen that, especially during the elections. There were so many people, uh, like Brian Carnes, for one, that claims to be a prophet. And they were saying that Hillary Clinton's going to win that uh that uh uh Donald Trump is going to lose. Then you had others saying that Donald Trump's not going to be president because Obama's going to uh de declare martial law. Okay, so now you have all of these people claiming to be prophets. The Lord used this this election to to uh show us who are the real prophets because and in order to prophesy, you don't have to be a prophet. When you preach the word of God, that's a form of prophecy. You're prophesying what the word says. Now, that means you have the gift of prophecy. It don't make you a prophet. It don't make you a prophet whatsoever. The Lord might give you some, some future reference, uh, something that's going to happen in the future that he wants you to tell people. That's fine. As long as it lines up with the word, it has to line up with the word because God's not going to tell you something that don't line up with his word. And so there are many people that claim that they're prophets and were, were terribly, terribly wrong in this election. Uh, but that's for another Bible study altogether. Basically, when you seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost, He'll give you the reason why you haven't received it yet. As for me, it's because I was still living a filthy life. But once I repented of these filthy things, I got on my knees again with tears in my eyes. And I said, Lord, am I not worthy to receive your Holy Spirit? And as soon as I said that, one of my friends walks up and lays hands on me. And instantly I received the Holy Spirit and fire baptism. Now, the reason why I call myself Pentecostal holiness is because the first part 
of the gospel, which is repentance, is required. It doesn't matter. 50 pastors can walk up to you and say, all you've got to do is say that sinner's prayer and, and, you're, and you're golden. And in the Pentecostal churches these days, that's what's being preached. I mean, the the past, there's not a pastor or person on this earth that can walk up to you and tell you you're saved. There's not a single person. Only you and God know that. So for a pastor to walk up to you and say, oh, you said the sinner's prayer, you're now saved. Really? How does he know that? Does he have personal God knowledge of knowing this, these things? And and see, that's why I say that the sinner's prayer has damned more people to hell than anything else. Is because they believe that all they have to do is say these magical words, and these magical words is going to give them the keys to heaven. There's more required than that. Yes, we're saved through uh, by grace through faith, but there's other things required. Like we mentioned in the first, the uh, first uh, of the series, is uh, like James said, uh, faith without works is dead. You can believe while, until you, you know until you're blue in the face, but the devils believe that, that that there's only one God, and they tremble. They know who God is. They know Jesus is God in the flesh, but they still they're they're still going to hell. You see, there's more to it. Uh, you have to repent, people. I mean. In order to get to baptism, see, the reason why some people get it when they say the sinner's prayer is because they're not drastically living their life in filthy ways. Uh, Christians here in India, uh, the women still cover their head when they pray. I mean, when men pray, they don't cover their heads. The men don't have long hair. And it's and it's like it was mentioned in the first part of uh, Acts. Uh when uh, when Peter and, and Paul and uh, all of them got together and they were talk, they were discussing on the ministry to the Gentiles which Paul was given. And Paul noticed as he was doing his ministry that many of the Gentiles were already living according to the way the Ten Commandments say live. See, Christians here are or, or the way they were back then, they were already un, in, in understanding that they can't live their life just any way they want to. They were already in understanding that they had to repent of their sins. So what's required of us is to at least live the Ten Commandments, man. I mean, that's, that's required. And if you're not living the Ten Commandments, you're still living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're still living a homosexual life, you're still stealing from stores, or you're still telling habitual lies, you're not going to receive the Holy Spirit and fire. I didn't receive it until after I repented of what I was doing that the Lord pointed it out. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when he's with you, is he points out what you need to do in order to receive the baptism, because God does not dwell in darkness. God does not dwell in filthiness at all. You have to ask him to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, and you have to live holy. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. If, if it was impossible to live holy, God wouldn't have told us to be holy, because he is holy. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't tell us to do things that are impossible. So it's possible to live holy. So a holy life is required to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that means the moral sins have to go. I mean, if you're still lying, you have to stop. If you're still stealing, you have to stop. And that's what's required. Now, there's denomination, Christian denominations out there that don't believe in speaking in tongues. They don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and therefore, they won't receive it. See, God won't push anything on you that you don't believe. So if you start believing in it, he's going to give it to you. 
And uh, Mark chapter 16, 17 and 18 specifically tells us what to expect in a, a true believer. And like I said, it's Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, which says, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and it and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Number one, they shall uh, cast out devils in Jesus' name. A true believer can lay hands on somebody and cast the devil out just like that. Because you're not doing it, Jesus is doing it. Number two, they shall speak with new tongues. See, if you don't believe in speaking in tongues, you're not going to get that gift. You have to believe. You have to read Acts chapter 2 and realize that it, that it is fact. Is speaking in tongues required to go to heaven? I don't think so. If you'll revert back to the first part of this series, what is required to get to heaven? I've mentioned in that first part of that series. Repentance. Faith, servitude, baptism, and that's and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Repentance is the main main thing that's important here because Jesus preached repentance and hell more than anything else that he preached, and people don't see that because they don't have revelation or discernment of the word. See. You have to ask the Lord to lead you and show you what these things mean. Like all the parables, all the parables talk about hell. They talk about what happens to the wicked and what happens to the just. Those that are truly saved and those that are not saved. And then there are those that live on the fence. They're neither hot nor cold. And in Revelations, Jesus says, uh, I would rather you be hot or cold, but if you're hot and cold, I will spew you, vomit you out of my mouth. That has to be the worst experience anybody would ever face is for the Lord Jesus Christ to vomit you out of his mouth. And that's what he does to those that say the sinner's prayer and, and go on living their life according to the way they want to. He spews them, vomits them out of his mouth. So this is part two of that series. And another thing I want to point out, in verse 18 of uh, Mark 16, uh, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Does that mean go around grabbing venomous snakes and letting them bite you? No, because then you're, you're, uh, you're tempting the Lord thy God. And that was the first thing that Jesus told the devil when the devil took him out to the wilderness to tempt him. Uh, the devil told him to, to jump off the, the pinnacle of the temple. And Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, taking up serpents means like if you are reaching in a cluster of grass to grab something... Like Paul, he was grabbing firewood and a snake came out and, and bit him in the hand. And it was a very poisonous snake and he didn't die. Why? Because he didn't intentionally grab the snake. So you have denominations out there like the Southern Baptists that believe that you can grab snakes and let it bite you and nothing happened to you. And there's been a lot of them die because they're tempting the Lord thy God. That means if you are accidentally bit by a snake, nothing will happen to you. It's the same thing uh, in the second part of this. And if they drink any, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Does that mean go out and uh, buy a gallon of bleach and drink it? No. That's if you're out here, like, like I'm out here in the world, and you have Hindus that will try to poison you. 
they will try to put poisonous poison in your drink so that you drink it so that you'll stop preaching the gospel. It'll kill you and you'll just stop preaching the gospel. That don't mean go, like I say, grab a gallon of Drano or something and, and drink it just to show people you're saved. It's not what that means. It means if you're out preaching the gospel and somebody gives you poison in your food or in your drink, nothing's going to happen to you because you're doing what Jesus wanted you to do. That's not intentionally drinking the poison. So I just wanted to clarify that. I thank you all for listening to this week's Bible study. Now, next week is going to be the third and final part, which I want to call glory. Uh, if you didn't see the first part of this series, the link will be in the description below. Uh, I thank you all for listening. The third part is going to be glory. And it's, it's about how we're going to live in eternity and glory as we, as we call it. And you're not going to want to miss that because that's, that's one of the most important things. This is after, after uh, we've come to the knowledge of Jesus, we've repented, we've lived our life, and then Jesus takes us home to be with him in glory. So I, I'm going to call next week's Bible study glory. I encourage you not to miss it. I thank you all for listening. I pray that you all have a blessed, blessed day. Oh, 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 oh,